2022 was a good year, but 2023 is going to be so much better because the best really is yet to come. Well, if you have God's Word with you, either in print or a digital copy on your phone, I want you to hold it up right now and repeat with me what we believe about this book. This is God's Word. It is a perfect treasure of divine instruction. It has God for its author. Salvation for its end, and truth without any mixture of error for its matter. It is the supreme source of truth for what we believe and how we live. Now, open up your copy of God's Word with me to the Old Testament book of First Chronicles, First Chronicles, chapter four. First Chronicles chapter 4. Early in 1991, Sherry and I were trying to determine God's will for our life. A, a church in Florida had been in constant, regular contact with us, and, and we were just trying to, to find out what God's will was. Now, for you that may not look at things this way, for us it wasn't about money, it wasn't about opportunity, it wasn't about location. It was just wanting to be in the center of God's will. And yet, we were having a very difficult time discerning that. We just didn't have peace. And at that point, God used two things to, to really give Sherry, peace of, Sherry and I peace of mind and, and to let us know what God's will was. The first one was a passage in the Old Testament that dealt with the blessings and the curses of God. And it... And it talked about how you could live in God's blessings for your life. And the second one was a song that was on a CD that, that someone gave us at Christmas. The song was by the Gaither Vocal Band, and this, it was entitled Beyond the Open Door. And the words were, were like this. It said, Beyond the Open Door is a new and fresh anointing. Hear the Spirit calling you to go, for the Lord will go before you into a greater power than you've ever known before. And God used uh, the words of Scripture that we read, and God used that song to confirm His will for our life. And we believe, and we still believe, that God was given us an opportunity to experience His blessings in a new and fresh way. And so my question for us this morning is this. Does God want to bless my life? Does God want to bless your life? And to answer that question, I want us to look at a rather obscure passage in the Old Testament about a man named Jabez. Now, if you're there in 1 Chronicles chapter 4 already, you'll notice the first thing you see is that this passage is in the middle of nine chapters of genealogies. Name after name, oftentimes of unpronounceable names. Now, why does God even include that in Scripture? Well, I believe there are several reasons. One is to show us that the Bible is set in history. The people that we read about in the Bible are actual people, and the stories we read about are actual stories. They're not fables. They're not myths. But I believe there's a second reason that God gives us all of these names, and that is God wants us to know that he knows our name. He knows each and every one of us by name. But unfortunately, oftentimes when we're reading passages like this, we kind of zone out, we, we go to sleep while we're reading, and I'm afraid that, that many times we miss out on some important truths like we see in 1 Chronicles 4, verses 9 and 10. Now, the second thing I want you to see about this passage is that, that Jabez lived during the time of the judges. That was a period when, when God's people were still trying to inhabit the promised land. You remember that, that God gave them the promised land, but they were to go in and take that promised land. And that's how it is when God oftentimes gives us things he doesn't just hand it to us on the silver platter. He gives us the power. He gives us the ability to do what he wants us to do and to take what he wants us to have, but we have to do something to receive it. 
And so they had to go into the promised land and they had to drive out the Canaanites, the Jebusites, and all of these ites that lived in the land. But unfortunately, many of them compromised. They didn't completely drive out the pagans that lived in the promised land. And, and so many of them were still living in this compromised position with these pagans living next door, trying to inhabit the land that God had given them, but they were not doing it with success. And that takes us to what we, we see in verses 9 and 10. Let me read it to you. You follow along. It says, There was a man named Jabez who was more honorable than any of his brothers. His mother named him Jabez because his birth had been so painful. He was the one who prayed to the God of Israel, Oh, that you would bless me, expand my territory. Please be with me in all that I do and keep me from all trouble and pain. And then notice what it says, and God granted him his request. Now I want you to listen to what that passage says says how it reads in the King James. It says, And Jabez was more honorable than his brothers, and his mother called his name Jabez, saying, Because I bore him with sorrow. And Jabez called on the God of Israel, saying, Oh, that thou wouldest bless me indeed, enlarge my coast, that thine hand might be with me, and that thou wouldest keep me from evil, and that it may not grieve me. And God granted him that which he requested. Now, and as we're reading through this exhaustive list of genealogies, it's as if God all of a sudden pauses and tells us about the prayer of one man. You see, Jabez prayed a bold prayer, and because of that, he experienced the blessings of God. I want you to think about that. Jabez prayed a bold prayer, and because he was willing to pray that bold prayer, he experienced the blessings of God. Now, that word blessed is found over 500 times in the English translation of our Bible. Now, let me just give you a few. In Genesis chapter 12, verse 2, God said to Abraham, I will make you into a great nation. I will bless you and make you famous. And you will be a blessing to others. In Numbers chapter 6, a, a passage that we now sing a song using these words, it, it says this, May the Lord bless you and keep you. May the Lord's face shine upon you and be gracious to you. May the Lord turn his face toward you and give you his peace. In Psalm 51 verse 12, David said this, he said, for you bless the godly. Let me say that again. For you bless the godly, O Lord. You surround them with your shield of love. And then in the very last book of the Old Testament, we discover a promise from God. Listen to what it says in Malachi chapter 3. It says, bring all the tithes into the storehouse so that there will be enough food in my temple if you do, says the Lord of heaven's armies, I will open the window of heaven for you. I will pour out a blessing so great you won't have enough room to take it in. Try it. Put me to the test. And, and so throughout the Old Testament, we discover that, that God wants to bless his people. And yet there are some conditions to those blessings. Now, there are two different words used for blessed or, or bless in the Old Testament. The first word is the Hebrew word eshes, a word that refers to happiness. But it's not a happiness that is dependent upon what happens to us, things that are happening in our life. It's not a happiness that is simply an emotion. It's an inward happiness or a joy that comes from God that transcends our situation, our circumstances. So God says, I want you to be happy. I want you to experience joy regardless of what is happening in your life. But the second word that's translated blessed is the word barak. And that word refers to divine favor. God's hand intervening in our lives. Now Robert Morris, who 
wrote a small book, it's a good book, entitled The Blessed Life, says being blessed means having supernatural power working for you. He goes on to say a blessed man may or may not be wealthy by the world's standards, but he enjoys a quality of life that billionaires would envy. I want to say that again. He may or may not be wealthy by the world's standards, but he is living a life that, that would make billionaires envious. Bruce Wilkinson, in his book, The Prayer of Jabez, defined it this way. He said, to bless is to impart supernatural favor. Then he goes on to say, when we ask for God's blessings, we're not asking for more of what we could get ourselves. That's important. When we ask for God's favor, we are not asking for more of what we could get ourselves. We're crying out for the wonderful, unlimited goodness that only God has the power to know about or give us. Now, what I want you to know this morning is this. God wants to give you joy, that happiness that is independent of, of any situation or circumstance, but he also wants to rain down his divine favor on your life. So God wants to give you joy that is independent of whatever is happening in your life, but he also wants to rain down his divine favor. Now, as we walk through this passage, we discover three things about Jabez and about God's blessings. The first one is this. Jabez was an honorable man. Now, if your Bible is open, look back at verse 9. It says that Jabez was more honorable than his brothers. Every time we find that word honorable in the Bible, it refers to someone of character. Now, this isn't saying that his brothers had no character. They had bad character. But what it is saying is that Jabez stood out among them. He was a man that sought to honor God with his life. And if you want to pray bold prayers that God hears and God answers, then I'm here to tell you this morning that you must seek to live a life that honors God in everything you do. If you want to pray the kind of prayer that Jabez prayed and God will answer that prayer, then you have to be an honorable person. But understand, Jabez had every reason in the world to be bitter, to rebel against God, to not be honorable. His name in Hebrew means pain. His mother named him pain. His mother wanted him to know for the rest of his life the pain and the sorrow that she experienced because of his birth. Now, we don't know what kind of pain she experienced. We don't know whether it was physical pain, emotional pain, relational pain. She could have been deserted, financial pain. We don't know, but we do know that it was so severe that she wanted her son to carry a name that reminded him of the pain that he caused for his entire life. Now can you imagine. The guilt Jabez could have carried. The pain Jabez could have experienced. Because his mother named him that kind of name. I think we would all agree that Jabez was in a dysfunctional home. But he didn't let that cause him to become bitter. He allowed that to help make him better. He was an honorable man in spite of his situation. You see, you need to understand this morning that your circumstances don't have to break you. Your circumstances can make you. They can make you into something great. Jabez was honorable in spite of his lot in life. Now notice verse 10. It says he prayed to God. He cried out to God. He called on God. Now, the word there for pray or cry out or call is the Hebrew word kara. It's an interesting word. It doesn't just mean to call out. It carries the idea of intensity. Jabez was crying out to God passionately. Let me ask you a question. 
Have you ever cried out to God that way? Have you ever wanted something so desperately that, I mean, you were literally crying out to God, begging him, pleading with him to give you what you were asking? This word kara also implies relationship. It, 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 it's the word that you would use when you were addressing someone by name. You see, you need to understand that before you can ever pray this kind of prayer, you, you must have a relationship with the God you're, you're praying to. Some people have this idea that anyone in, at any time can pray to God and God's going to hear their prayers, but the Bible doesn't say that. The Bible teaches that the only prayer that God is obligated to hear from someone who isn't saved is the prayer of, of repentance, the prayer asking for salvation. Now, God, in his grace and in his mercy, may choose to hear other prayers, but God is not obligated. And yet the Bible makes it clear that there are times and situations when the child of God calls out to God and God obligates himself to answering those prayers. Let me give you an example of what I mean by this. Suppose I'm, I'm walking down the road and someone that I don't know, I, I don't have a clue who they are, comes up to me and says, I need $1,000 and I need it right now. And I don't know who they are. I don't know anything about them. I don't know their situation. I don't know their circumstances. I'm here to tell you that I'm probably not going to give them $1,000. But if one of my children come up to me in desperation and cry out and say, Dad, I need $1,000 and I need it now, chances are if I have the money, the resources, I'm going to give it to them. And the reason I am is because they're my children and I love them and I have a relationship with them. And that's how this passage is playing out here. Jabez was an honorable man in spite of his circumstances. He loved God. He sought to bring glory to God with his life. He had this personal relationship with God that called him, caused him to cry out to God. Now next, Notice his prayer. Jabez prayed four things. The first thing he prayed was, bless me indeed. In the Hebrew, the, the word bless is repeated. It, it's repeated because when you repeated something in the Hebrew language, it was adding intensity to the request. What Jabez is saying is, Lord, bless me a whole lot. Give me everything that you will. Jabez was praying God's bless for his life. Now, there are some people that believe that it's wrong to pray for God's blessings. We shouldn't pray that, but that's simply not true. The Bible teaches that we should pray for God's blessings. Jabez prayed pretty much the same prayer that Jacob prayer prayed. Do you remember that in, in Genesis chapter 32, verse 26, when Jacob was wrestling with God, Jacob said, I will not let you go until you bless me. Jacob said, I'm holding on to you. I'm clinging to you until you bless me. Jacob wanted to experience God's blessings, just like Jabez did. Now, notice, Jabez was leaving it entirely up to God how God would bless him. He didn't say, Lord, bless me indeed by giving me a, a new tent, by giving me a, a new camel. He didn't say those kind of things. He said, Lord, bless me indeed, and I trust your judgment as you bless me. Now, there are some that say this is a selfish prayer because he prayed, Lord, bless me. It's okay for me to pray, Lord, bless for Sean. But if I pray, Lord, bless me, it's selfish. But I don't think that's the case at all because God doesn't answer selfish prayers. The Bible makes that clear. In James chapter 4, verse 3, it says, When you ask, you do not receive because you ask with wrong motives that you may spend what you get on your pleasures. So God's never going to answer selfish prayers. So I believe the question is, how do I want to use the blessings that I'm asking God for? 
You see, if I'm asking God to bless me so that I can have a bigger house, I can have more resources so that I can enjoy life more and I can do more things, and God's not going to answer that. But if I'm saying, Lord, bless me so that I can be a blessing to the nation, so I can be a blessing to the world, I believe that God will answer that. The Bible makes it clear that God blesses us so that we can be a blessing. Do you remember Genesis 12, verse 2? Part of that verse says, I will bless you and you will be a blessing to others. God said, Abraham, I'm going to bless you so that you can be a blessing. Now, there are some of you here this morning that you are blessed materially. God has blessed you in ways that he hasn't blessed most people. And when God blesses you that way, you really do have to ask yourself, why is it that God is putting these resources into my hands? Because it's not just so that you can live in a nice, comfortable home. There's nothing wrong with that. It's not so that you can drive a, a car that, that you can depend on. There's nothing wrong with that. There's nothing wrong with going on vacations and enjoying those things. But God doesn't bless you simply so that you can enjoy life. If God has blessed you materially, financially, he has blessed you so that you really can be a blessing to others. I'm convinced the the main reason that many of us are not being blessed is because of selfish motivation. But I think that there's another reason that we aren't being blessed today, and that's because we simply aren't asking. I think a lot of us just aren't asking for God's blessings in our life. Now, I want you to listen to what what Jesus said in Matthew chapter 7. Jesus said, ask, and it will be given to you. Seek, and you will find. Knock, and the door will be opened to you. For everyone who asks receives, he who seeks finds, he who knocks, the door will be opened. Which of you, if his son asks for fish, will give him a snake? If you then, though you're evil, know how to give good gifts to your children, how much more will your Father in heaven give good gifts to those who ask him? Oh, listen to me, dear brothers and sisters. God wants to answer our prayers. God wants to give us good gifts. And that's not a health and wealth gospel. That's just simple scriptural truth. But we have to make sure that we're not asking selfishly, and we have to make sure that we're asking. Notice the second thing that Jabez prayed. He said, expand my territory. Now, this reminds me of of the words God spoke to the prophet Isaiah in Isaiah 40, 54. He said, enlarge the place of your tent. Stretch your tent curtains wide. Do not hold back. Lengthen your cords. Strengthen your your stakes. Jabez was praying, Lord, remove the barriers. Let me accomplish more and more for you. Now, let me remind you, when we read the book of Joshua, we discover that God had had given each of the tribes of Israel land that they were to take, land that they were to occupy, and yet many of them didn't. And here's Jabez now praying, Lord, I believe I've taken the land you've told me to take. Give me more land to take. He's saying, God, I want to do more and more for you. Can you believe that? He's not just asking God to bless him. He's asking God to give him more to do. Now, unfortunately, many people today want to sit back and and watch other people do while we just receive the blessings of God. But that's not how it works. The Bible teaches that our territory is often tied to our faithfulness. And understand, God will hold us accountable for the gifts and the resources and the opportunities that he gives us. If you don't believe that, remember the parable Jesus told of the talents? Remember that? 
Remember how he gave one ten talents, he gave one five talents, he gave one one talent, the one who had ten, he doubled it, the one who had five, he doubled it, the one who had one buried it because he didn't want to lose it, he didn't use it, and God took that one talent from that guy and gave it to the one who had ten. God wants you to use what he's given you for his glory and his honor. Jesus said this in John 15, when you produce much fruit, you're my true disciples. This brings great glory to God. God wants to expand your territory. God wants to expand your your ability to make a difference in this world. But if he is going to do that, you have to be faithful with what God has given you. Now let me give you a couple of things about God enlarging your territory. First, if you want God to enlarge your territory, you have to be willing to leave your comfort zone. You're never going to break new ground or accomplish new tasks without stepping out. And it's scary, isn't it, to leave our comfort zone? Our our comfort zone is what we're comfortable doing. And, And most of us, we stay where we're comfortable because it's easy. It's comfortable. But if you want God to enlarge your territory, you've got to step out of that comfort zone. Second, if you want God to enlarge your territory, you've got to watch out for border bullies, people who don't want you to break new ground. These people aren't necessarily bad people, but these are people who have no faith. They're full of fear. Do you remember what happened when the spies came back from going into the promised land? Do you remember that? Ten said, we can't take that land. Man, it's full of giants. And, and two said, man, God has given us land. We've got to go in and take this land. It's not that the ten men were bad men. They were chosen to go into that land and scout out the land. Why? Because they were leaders. They were good men. But they had no faith. They were living in fear. And because of that, they, they caused the entire nation of Israel to wander in the wilderness for 40 years. Third. God will enlarge your territory, but you may have to struggle to occupy it. The struggle is showing God that this is really important to you. So Jabez prayed, Lord, bless me. Bless me abundantly. Then he said, Lord, enlarge my territory. Give me more to do. And then the third thing he said is, Lord, be with me in all that I do. Literally, What he was saying is, may your hand be with me. What he was praying here is, Lord, may your presence and your power be with me. He was recognizing as he prayed that what he wanted to accomplish was bigger than anything that he could do on his own. And if he was going to do what he was asking God to give him to do, then he was going to need God's help. You see, many of us operate under this formula. I want you to think about this. My abilities plus my experience plus my personality plus my training plus my breaks equals my territory. Let me say that again. My abilities plus my experience plus my personality plus my training plus the breaks that I get in life equals my territory. But God says the proper formula is my willingness and weakness plus God's will and power equals my territory. You see, my territory isn't dependent upon upon my abilities. God can give me the abilities he wants me to have. It's not dependent upon the breaks that I get in life because God can give you whatever breaks he wants you to have. It's your willingness to trust him and step out. Now, how do you experience God's hand in your life? Well, let me give you several ways. God's hand intervenes to provide the resources we need to enlarge our territory. Remember Daniel? God's hand opened doors and grants permission for us to enlarge our territory. Remember Nehemiah? God's hand protects us both from human and spiritual attacks as we enlarge our territories. God's hand produces power that overcomes the limitations that we have as we enlarge our territories. Have you ever seen God's hand clearly working in your life? as you were seeking to enlarge the territory that God has given you? Finally, he prays, keep me from evil. 
Now, some translations have keep me from harm, but personally, I think evil here is a better translation. The word can be translated both ways. But in Genesis chapter 6, verses 5 and 6, it says, The Lord saw how great man's wickedness on the earth had become, and that every inclination of the thoughts of his heart was only evil all the time. That word wickedness and evil in Genesis 6 is the same word here that is often translated pain. You see, I think what, what Jabez was praying is, Lord, keep me from evil, because I know as I seek to step out and experience your blessings, as I seek to enlarge the territory for your glory and your honor, as I seek to live my life with your hand upon me, I know that the enemy is going to attack me. And I need you to keep me from evil. I got to tell you, I, I don't pray, Lord, just keep me from evil. I pray, Lord, keep me from temptation. And the reason I pray that is because I know that, that if the temptation comes, oftentimes I'm prone to wander. I'm prone to give in to the temptation. And so I pray, Lord, I don't want, I don't want even want to face the temptation. I, I want you to keep me from that temptation. But if the temptation does come, what are we called to do? Well, the Bible says we're called to run, we're called to flee, we're called to get out of the way as quick as possible. Now, Bruce Wilkinson, in his book, talks about five types of evil temptations that every one of us needs to guard against. You may want to write these down, because I think there are temptations that we all face. There's the temptation of pride. There's the temptation of power. There's the temptation of possessions. The temptation of lustful pleasures. And the temptation of position. And all of those temptations can lead us to evil if we are not careful. Now notice what it says next. God granted his request. Jabez was more honorable than his brothers. He sought to live his life in a way that brought honor and glory to God. And as he was living his life in spite of bad circumstances, he prayed a bold prayer. Lord, bless me. Bless me mightily. Enlarge my territory, my influence. May your hand of blessing be upon me. Keep me from evil. God granted his request. Jabez was no different than any and every one of us here today. It's no accident that God put that passage of Scripture in his word. He put it there because he wanted each and every one of us to know that the same prayer that Jabez prayed, we can pray. And just as God answered Jabez's prayer, he will answer our prayer. I want to challenge you to do something in 2023. Today is the first day of a new year. You haven't missed a day. You can start it off right now. Did I say it wrong? Today is the first day of a new year. You haven't missed a day. It's day one. I encourage you right now to begin today praying a bold prayer. Just as you're having your prayer time, which I hope you do, you make that a habit in 2023. Start your prayer time. God bless me. Bless me abundantly this year. Enlarge my territory, my influence, my position for your glory. May your hand be upon me and keep me from evil. And just pray that simple prayer. And as you pray it this year, every day, in every situation, Watch God.
do amazing, abundant things in your life. Now, here's what I want you to do. Our worship team's going to come up and they're going to lead us in a song. And for you who are physically able, I want you to come to this altar this morning. And I want you to begin right now praying that prayer. And that may not be the only thing you pray. But I want you to pray that prayer and then cry out to God. I want you to stand. I'm going to be down front if anyone needs to, to talk. Our altar is going to be open. Father God, this is your time. And I ask you, Father, to have your way in each and every one of our lives this morning. Father, I pray that you will bless our church. Bless us abundantly in 2023. Lord, I pray that you will enlarge our territory, our influence. Lord, I pray that we will see hundreds and hundreds come to faith in you in 2023. I pray that you will give us more campuses in 2023. I pray, Father, that we will see more unreached, unengaged people groups hearing the gospel in 2023 than ever before. Father, I pray that your hand will be upon us. And Father, I pray you'll keep us from evil. Help us to live lives that are honoring and pleasing to you. And I pray this, Father, in Jesus' name. Amen. Our altar is open. As we sing, you come.
Father God, we thank you, we praise you, we honor and adore you for who you are. And Lord, we do ask that this year we will live lives that are honorable, that bring honor and glory to you so that you can bless us, bless us abundantly in every way imaginable. And I pray this, Father, in Jesus' name, amen. And then let me just remind you of two things. One, beginning next week, we're starting a series that I really do believe. If you will put into practice the things that we're going to talk about, the things that we're going to teach, it will change your life in 2023. But, but you need to understand, just like a gym membership won't make you healthy, <laughs> hearing a sermon won't make you healthy, Amen. You've got to put into practice what you learn from the truths that we give you. And so we're going to be talking about 2023 and, and how your life really can be changed. And, and it's all about six habits that if you put those into practice, it really is going to change everything. Now, I want you to begin by doing one thing. When you leave, you can get a handful of these invite cards and just pass them out this week. Invite someone to come with you. Anybody can do that. You can give these as you go through the line at Chick-fil-A or Starbucks or you buy your gas, whatever. Just give out, give out these cards. The second thing I want to remind you is we've got our giving boxes at every door. Thank you again for your faithfulness. And because of your faithfulness, we're able to touch lives and, and, and hopefully make a, a dent in the darkness of our world. And so we've got our giving boxes at every door. You can give that way. You can give online. You can, you can give through the mail. But thank you so much for your faithfulness. Remember, this is your mission field. And until God moves you somewhere else, be on mission for Jesus. Amen. God bless you. I'll see you next Sunday at 8, 9.30, or 11. You have a great week.